they kind of send you out of the room and you're just stood in the corridor being like, did I pass? Did I fail? Oh my God, I failed. I failed spectacularly. Of course I failed. And it's like the worst five minutes of your life before they like call you back in. And then like the senior professor sort of sat me down and said, congratulations, Dr. Smethurst. And I was like, I could cry <laughs> all day in front of the senior professor. So at Oxford, where I did my PhD, they have this really cool tradition that you pop a champagne cork into the ceiling tile when you come out of your viva. <laughs> and you sign your name next to the dent that you leave. And you really get to like leave your mark on Oxford physics, which is so cool. I got it first time and literally, I think I was more scared for that than I was for my viva. I was terrified of it ricocheting off the ceiling and hitting me in the eye. Like fully like nightmares about having a black eye on the day of my viva. Ooh, that was handy, thank you. <laughs> It's also a binary dent, which is an astronomer I was really quite happy about. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like a binary dent! <laughs> Thank you. So both, the, both ends of the champagne cork dinted into the ceiling because the champagne cork came out and then came horizontal. So it looks like a little binary star in the ceiling. Oh, well done. Are they unusual? Or? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so I was uh, born in Preston. Uh, raised in Chorley, so this is Lancashire. I went to school in Bolton and then I went to do physics with astronomy at Durham University. I was like six years old and wanted a telescope for Christmas kind of thing. Like I was always into space, like space books on the shelf, getting little telescopes, always wanting to go out and see the sky. But I hated physics. So up to about GCSE, I couldn't stand physics. Forces and light goes in straight lines just didn't hold any interest for me at all. And then it took getting to GCSE and starting to do astronomy and radioactivity and things like this that made me realise that I absolutely loved it. It was the sheer scale of space that I thought was awesome. You read in your space books about Jupiter is so much bigger than Earth and this is how much more massive the Sun is and this is how far away the Moon is. And you think, as a kid, wow, you can't even imagine those distances and yet you can go outside and still see it in the sky. Just blew my mind. <laughs> I got a little thing. It was like a... Um, I don't even know how big it was. I think it's like a one inch refractor or something. It was tiny, but it was really cool. I could see the moon, basically, and Jupiter looked like a bigger, bright spot than it did with your own eye, but it was still amazing to have. I actually wanted to be a paediatrician at one point. I also wanted to be a marine biologist because I loved dolphins and wanted to work with dolphins. And then my mum told me that, don't be ridiculous, if you were a marine biologist in the UK, you'd just take river samples from the Thames all day and that would be all you'd do. Not realising that I could move outside of the UK to do that. And that also as an astronomer, I am probably now gonna end up doing that as well. <laughs> so at Durham, I did physics and astronomy because I knew astronomy was something that I loved. I always wanted to do the astronomy modules. So I got to do things like measuring the temperature of sunspots, uh, at Durham in my second year, we took solar telescopes out on the grass in the science site and people looked at us like we were crazy, but I thought it was great. Uh, I got to use the telescopes on top of the roof as well, uh, you know, shoveling six inches of snow with a broom off the telescopes in my third year on every clear night you could get, which meant sacrificing a lot of nights out as a student, but it was worth it in the end. End of four years, you're thinking, what on earth do I do now? Everything up until that point has been so sort of prescribed a little bit. You go to school, you do your A-levels, you go to university, and then you're just left to your own devices. And everyone's going off and applying for grad schemes, so you think, okay, I'll, I'll apply for a grad scheme, sure. And I ended up in the September working at Rolls-Royce on their engineering grad scheme because I never thought, really sat down about what do I want to do. And then it took me till about November to December to realise that I missed astronomy so much. Like, it didn't matter that I was kind of doing the same thing every day, sat at a desk and going through data and, you know, just talking to people about science. It wasn't astronomy. It wasn't the same thing. And I missed it so much that I started applying for PhD positions in the January. I applied five different places. So uh, Manchester, Bristol, Durham again, Oxford, four different places. I uh, had interviews at all of those places. Um, not just an interview to say, do they want to work with you, but also do you want to work with them? You know, your supervisor's going to be your supervisor for three years, so you've got to like that person. And I was then just waiting to see who wanted me, where I wanted to go. I got the call from Oxford that I'd been accepted on a PhD 
whilst I was in Bella Italia in Manchester with my mum. And it was a very excited phone call. Um, I was so happy. The project there was perfect. It was working with Galaxy Zoo, which is this online citizen science platform that gets the public to classify galaxies, which I thought was amazing that I could do research off the back of public's efforts. So my thesis was trying to figure out why galaxies stop forming stars. So you see a lot of blue, spiral, beautiful galaxies, and then you see a lot of red, boring, blobbish kind of shaped galaxies. We call them elliptical galaxies. And so the idea is if something's blue, it's very hot, it's star forming, it's got lots of young stars. If it's red, it's kind of dead and dying and there's not much going on. But the thing is, you end up seeing lots of red spirals and blue ellipticals. So it's kind of all tangled together, the shape that things are and whether things are forming stars or not. So the idea was to use the public's classifications from Galaxy Zoo and then all our observations of galaxies to look at this like statistically across a huge population, like as many galaxies you can get your hands on and, and see what was going on using big population statistics. Things are more complicated than they seem. <laughs> that is definitely what I learned. Um, before people thought there was these kind of like two specific tracks that the spiral galaxies go one way and the elliptical galaxies go the other way. When you look at the whole population and you use statistics, you see that actually there's kind of this spread of different rates that galaxies can stop forming stars. Um, and you also find that the black holes in the centre of the galaxies play a huge role as well and they could be shutting down star formation really rapidly. And that also whether there's a lot of galaxies around a galaxy or whether the galaxy is isolated can also have a massive impact as well and you see that sort of in the statistical results which is really cool. So yeah, this whole heft of a thesis and in fact this is double-sided and you have to print it out when you give it in single-sided so it's even higher than that when you give it in and it feels like such a weight and a meat of work that you've done. What do you think like an astronomer who reads that will think okay that's new information to me? Yeah I mean well that's a definition of a thesis is that you have to add something to the scientific collective knowledge. There's lots of things I've added galaxies do stop forming stars at different rates there's not two clear channels that's something new that people will come to. I mentioned that black holes can have a really big impact, the supermassive ones at the centre of galaxies. Besides learning a lot about star formation, what did you learn about astronomy over the three years of your PhD? That there isn't an answer, and that's where the fun bit is. You know, I got into physics and astronomy and maths because I liked it over English because there was an answer. But the whole part about research is there isn't an answer, and astronomy is beautifully complicated, and this huge big picture that is impossible to visualize as for one person and that collaboration between people is crucial in order to be able to figure it out. Yeah I mean the whole you know what have the astronomers ever done for us is is such a repeated phrase in society and it's not necessarily a direct thing that we're doing you know we're not directly curing cancer but the imaging techniques that are being developed that we're pushing forward to be like we need to see deeper and further and more than we've ever seen before are then applied to things like MRI machines and CT scans that are then used in medicine. You know astronomers needed a better way to transfer data so they invented Bluetooth and now every single person has that in their pocket basically on their phone. So it's the kind of indirect things that come from astronomy that are useful in society but then also like humans are naturally curious. Everybody wants to know where we come from and how the universe is and what it's made of and those answers are going to come ultimately from astronomy. Do you think most people in the street are curious for those answers at the level you're looking at? I'd hope that if you said to them, hey there's a black hole at the centre of every galaxy, they'd be like, really? Cool. And I hope if you said to them, you know, the universe started this way, they'd at least be curious enough to then ask a follow-up question. <laughs> um, even if they didn't understand it, they can still be like, but wait, what about this? I'd hope that there was some vestige of curiosity at the back of everybody's minds. Yeah. I got this job and basically they told me, write up your PhD as quick as you possibly can. And so I wrote it up in two months <laughs> with a 10-day holiday <laughs> squished in the middle as well, which was quite fun. Uh, and ended at Christmas, which was nice. And then in the January, 2nd of Jan, packed up, moved, 
started my new job on the 3rd. So the whole point of this job was that I wrote a proposal to say I want to research this and then they picked it because they thought that sounded cool. And so the research proposal is on this idea of how do black holes affect their galaxies? Do they stop them from forming stars? Does the energy output from the black hole sort of move through the galaxy and you get this sort of like wave of sort of star formation stopping? Or does it put energy out into the sort of surrounding area which then cuts off gas supplies so there's no more star formation, this kind of thing. That's what I'm going to be focusing on. I'm going to be using this really cool new instrument as well that doesn't just take one picture of a galaxy, it takes 127 little ones. And so you can like, like sort of jigsaw puzzle the galaxy up so that you can see like what is going on in various different areas. Oh, yeah, there's loads of people working on this, coming at it from different angles, like sort of there's people coming at it from the simulation angle, the theory angle, there's people coming at it from different wavelengths as well. I'm looking in the optical, in the UV, and there's people coming at it from the radio, the x-ray, and even the infrared as well. So we're all working on the same thing. It's just, you know, to prove something, to prove a theory, you need all those little bits of observational facts in order for it to sort of build up and say, right, we're definitely sure of this now. The other part of this fellowship is that I'm going to be working with 60 Symbols and I am going to be making videos about my research and what I'm getting up to and cool things in astronomy and what I think you guys want to know about. I've always been into outreach, you know, any age, basically, kids, adults. I think it's fantastic in, for any person if you can just help them understand something. Like that light bulb moment when they're finally like, oh, I get it now, is so gratifying as, in, as a scientist that you've made someone understand the world that they live in. That's true. But there's a subtlety here, which is that actually what you're doing isn't the two-body problem. So the two-body problem is if you have the sun and something in orbit around it. What you're actually doing is a three-body problem. You've got the sun, you've got the earth, and you've got your satellite. 